Thanks, Angela. Did anybody call in sick to work today? No. I did, because I was on um, page 150 of Harry Potter. <laughs> I won't say anything. I hope I can finish it, because I can't miss any more work. But here, there's the thing with that book, is 12 million copies in its first printing. And uh, I got mine at Bailey Coy on Friday at midnight, and the line went all the way down to the next street. I guess that was Republican, and then up Republican. And uh, it just gets me excited, because when people read, uh, good things happen. So. I can't wait till a 12 million selling poetry book comes out. <laughs> Richard Gold's the next reader. He was nominated by the Pongo Publishing Teen Writing Project, which he also founded. He was nominated by their board, okay? Um, the Pongo Teen Writing Project is a writing therapy nonprofit that terms ho serves homeless, incarcerated, and hospitalized youth. In his past, Richard developed a writing therapy program at an adolescent psychiatric clinic and earned an MA in poetry with a collection of poems about the youth and the emotions at the clinic. There's more credits, but you can read them on the handout that's on the bar if you haven't gotten one already. And please welcome Richard Gold. Thank you, Bob. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to see all of you. I'm just thoroughly enjoying being here. I'm going to read some poems from Youth in Juvenile Detention. The idea of the poet populace as an advocate for democracy, to me, that means everyone has a voice, everyone's treated with respect, everyone's treated fairly. And so I wish I had time to talk about all that I've learned from the work that I've done with youth. But I want to make a few quick points. One is that we say to the kids right from the heart about who you are as a person. And consistently, they write about abuse mm -hmm. and trauma, abandonment, parents with alcohol and drug problems, violence in the streets, in the home. Secondly, we work in environments such as a psych hospital where we have some feedback from therapists. Kids are writing these sad poems, and there's this other side, that they are writing about things that they've had difficulty talking about, even in therapy, that they're having breakthroughs in their treatment from these poems that they write. They are elated, something you don't see as you hear these sad poems. They are elated to express themselves, to give some sense of who they are in the world, which I think is a very basic need that we have. And the third point is about resilience. Because even people who care about these kids often think that they are part of a cycle of abuse, that their lives are already ruined. And I've, I'm so glad I did some reading on resilience, and I recommend that to all of you. But in two studies that I've become familiar with, it's about a sixth of the kids who come from these terrible circumstances who become the recidivists, who can't break out of it. A third of the kids don't have these kind of problems. Another third have problems as children and adolescents, and I expect a lot of those are among my authors. And that um, people, resilient people, are more honest, more determined to be caring to their own families than many others. The books I'm reading from are books we've published, and we may not have just, we give them away free to kids, and maybe we haven't published 12 million, but we've given away 10,000 books to kids in June. Okay, poetry. I may not have time to read my own poem here, but I'm going to read some poems by kids. This one's by a 13-year-old in juvenile detention, How Tucked in the Corner. You see that I'm alone, you see that I steal, but you don't know me. You would know me if you knew how hard it was to live alone. You knew how love has hurt me. You knew your mom didn't love you. You see that I smoke, you see that I fight, but you don't know me. 
You would know me if you knew how I turn emotions to haze. You knew how I don't fear death. You knew how tucked in the corner was sadness. Please applaud the kids. This is their poetry. I know. This is by a 14-year-old girl in juvenile detention. Who am I? When I was born, I thought I'd be an innocent child, but now I'm here in juvenile. Like my mother, out running the streets, smoking crack and robbing people for money, and I thought, who am I? I lost my virginity to a guy I didn't know, hanging out with older people who wanted to get in my pants, thinking I could get in the game, and I thought, who am I? It's harsh out there. All you do is sit waiting for crack, spending your money on crack, being a crack whore. And I thought, who am I? People running in and out, worrying about cops being thrown in the back of a police car and thinking, who am I? And now I sit in my room thinking what to do with my life. Be like my mother or be like myself. I'm ending up like her, but I'm different. I can change my ways. I'm not like anybody else. And I thought to myself, that is who I am. This is by a 14-year-old boy in juvenile detention. It's called Loveless in two parts. Loveless number two. Three words remain unheard. I love you. Emotions stay unstirred. I love you. Hopes shatter against white cell walls. Before I succumb to sleep, icy tears fall. Heart cracks and bleeds, I love you. Basic unmet needs, I love you. No trust anymore, yet I'm behind locked doors. Oh well, whatever. I love you no more. Loveless I may be. In here, more of my heart is confined than my body. People abandon me along my road to redemption. No one to lean on, my life proceeds without me, leaving me to catch up using collect calls. I'm so loveless here. Past mistakes reap their price for me with scythes of regret. Loveless I may be, but I love being loveless, not loving myself. I'll be out with the roll of the dice. Um, I don't have time to read my own poem, but I'll read another one by a teen here. Just Another Girl. This by a girl, she's about 14, 15, also in juvenile detention. It could never happen to me, could it? Raped like my mom, would it? Beat like my mom, should it? Drunk off my ass with nowhere to turn. My dad, that's who I think of, alcohol, coke. He thinks it's a joke. Heroin crack, she does it to ease the pain in her back. Liquor forties bud, I turn to them, they call me a thug. Confused in this crazy world, what to do? A number, just another girl. Where will I go, what will I see? Lord, forgive me for my sins when I get there. Will you open the gates for me? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Richard Gold. There are two more readers in tonight's program. Before I introduce them, though, I want to say thanks to um, Tom and the Seattle Channel. Tom's a videographer, and he's shot tonight's reading and also the reading at the Seattle Library that was on a week ago, Sunday to Frank Video, um, Nick Licata's legislative assistant for the arts specifically, who is doing not only uh, helping manage these videographies, but also making a documentary of the poet populist. Some of you have been interviewed for that. And um, also, I think that this, the uh, public library reading might already be up on poetpopulist.org. And this one will be soon. So you can have your friends who missed it go to the site and check out the readings and, of course, vote. John Olson was nominated by Filter Literary Journal. 
He is the author of seven collections of poetry and prose poetry, and has a forthcoming collection on Black Widow Press in 2008 called Backscatter of New and Selected Work. Um, John has many, many credits which I won't read, but I do want to read this quote from him about poetry. He says, it's what gives our language its essence and rapture, its muscle and reach. It is the full comprehension of the mind's independence and freedom, the spurt and urgency of its plumes and pearls. It is the lifeblood of a culture, the pulse of its meat and meaning. Now you get to hear the guy who wrote that, John Olson. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> and I'd like to thank Jennifer for nominating me. And I'm going to plunge right into it here. Not chatter too much because I timed this, so it would fit within seven minutes or <laughs> twenty. Gray's anatomy. It's hard to like gray. It is inherently mournful. It smacks of death and prophecy and Macbeth. It lingers in the air like a raw uncertainty. It floats like an immense contusion above the earth, the residue of a collision between white and black, good and evil, being and nothingness. Gray is the color of thought. Thought is gray because it emanates from the brain, and the brain, the human brain, is gray. Gray is a cloud when it is tinged with thunder. Gray is a cloud when it is tinctured with bulk. Borders and definitions collapse in gray. Borders and definitions collapse in thought. This is what makes thought gray, ambiguity. Ambiguity makes the color of thought gray, and clouds and ashes and compromise and accommodation gray. Everything uncertain and indistinct and equivocal is gray. But this isn't always the case. Things get sticky here. It is the nature of gray to get sticky and confused, because battleships and destroyers and sidewalks are gray, and battleships and destroyers and sidewalks are brutally gray, are brutally certain and distinct. So you see what happens when one enters the realm of gray. Nothing sticks, and everything sticks because gray inclines toward tenuity and dissolution, but it is also the color of cannons and resolution. It is the color of phantoms and tombstones and Edgar Allan Poe, but it is also the color of the USS Hornet, USS Missouri, USS Shenandoah, and the USS Seattle. It is also the color of the sidewalk on McGraw, the sidewalk on Fifth Avenue North, the sidewalk on Roy, the sidewalk on Ray, and the sidewalk on Finney Avenue North. Some sidewalks veer toward off-white, but the older sidewalks are incontrovertibly gray. Gray is the color of cemetery mists and glacial terrains, but it also has an urban dimension, because in sidewalks and parking lots and building foundations, the permeability and oatmeal-like quality of cement hardens into a hue of gray so emphatic in its grayness, it forgives all inattention with the grace of its anonymity. Because gray is the sorcery of transition. Because gray is the arithmetic of smoke. Mm -hmm. It anoints indecision with the vermouth of nuance. It blesses definition with the gauze of ambiguity. The cello employs gray in the resonance of its bass. There is gray in excursion and gray in horticulture. Gray is the mood of northern Europe steeped in its books. Like a painting by Bruegel, like a mist moving through the forests of Bavaria. Gray is the color of the world on the first morning of its existence. Gray is the color of existence. Existence when it is gray. Existence when it has everything and nothing to say. <laughs> And this one's called Open House. Let us go into the house. It is a big house. It is larger than an igloo, yet smaller than a violin. Let us become acquainted with its tints. I see a red door, and I want to paint it black. 
No colors anymore, I want them to turn black. There are volumes in the walls and fur in the furniture. The wind is outside, it blows around, spreading description. Various holes terminate in mud. The plumbing maneuvers water. The plumbing cannot be seen, it is inside the walls. We know it is there because we can hear it gurgle and hiss. It offers faucets and taste. It offers figures and rain. One by one, the walls reveal art. This is a Matisse, this is a Picasso. See how the highway becomes a thick endeavor. We must endeavor to endeavor to understand endeavor. <laughs> All highways endeavor to take its places. Highway 61 goes from Mississippi to Chicago. Meanwhile, the house protects us like a fullback. The house wanders through its lines like a cave. The house comforts us and completes a mosaic of cups. There is a balloon inside whose radius is blessed with plywood. Sheetrock provides section and shape. The windows provide songs. The doors provide knobs. We experience the floor as a form of intention. It protects our feet from rocks and opposition. The carpet enhances the sensation of the spine. It beckons us to walk on it. It beckons us to lie on it. It introduces us to beckoning. It introduces us to the weight of our bones and the climate of our skin. Photographs on the walls make life appear hysterical and wicker. The space in the house is fluid. We are bathed in divernimento. Deliveries occur in the vestibule. A subterranean moon implies the garage is a coin of music. But in actuality, the garage glides into our perception as an adjunct or mass. Mass pertains to volume as volume pertains to distribution, and this results in a house of language. Videos woo the lure of the fable. Their stories open us to possibilities of sepia. Our bodies are fables of skin and blood. The skull is a house of bone. The brain is a house of nerve. These are metaphors. The metaphor is a house of sticks. Skeletons swarming with Rembrandt. Hefty emotions of light and shadow, alternating links of phosphate and deoxyribose. If a man dies, shall he live again? And in what house? A chip off the old block. A chip of benefit which benefits from rock. Wonder is a chip of immersion in scope. Abstraction is a house of spheres and charcoal. We all live in a yellow submarine. We all live in a house of language, our house of being, our house of non-being our house of nothingness and bunting, our bungalow of bonnie clabber, our house of Poland, our house of Greece, our house of battle, our house of books, our white house, our black house, our house of jelly and ink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. John Olson. So, um, one more reader. Hard to believe that we have come to the conclusion of our event already. Um, I do want to thank some people, some organizations, too. Um, first of all, the City of Seattle and Nick Licata and the council who have funded, the city council actually put money towards this program this year. So, if you're in touch with any of your council members, you might thank them. Um, also, thank you to 11th Hour Productions, who is the fiscal sponsor of um, this program and uh, also helped a bit with the promotions. And thanks to the Seattle Public Library, who hosted the reading a couple uh, 10 days ago, and to the Hugo House, who hosted these readings. They donated the space, and they also helped to promote. And then uh, Bumbershoot is hosting the reading on September 2nd and is providing the cash to the winner of the election. So thanks to all the sponsors. <laughs> Cody Walker was nominated by Seattle Arts and Lectures. He teaches at uh, the University of Washington where he teaches English and also poetry through Seattle Arts and Lectures Writers in the Schools program. He also serves as a writer in residence at the Richard Hugo House Cottages in Belltown. He received the 2003 James Boatwright III Prize for Poetry from Shenandoah and the 2005 Distinguished Teaching Award from the UW English Department. Please welcome Cody Walker.
Well, thanks. Wow, I can't see anybody. Um, I want to echo uh, some of these thanks that have just been uh, put out there. Uh, to Bob, especially, for organizing this. He's done a fantastic job. Um, and to Nick and to, and to Frank for organizing this as well, um, for uh, the Yugo House for hosting it, uh, all the terrific organizations that have nominated the lot of us, and um, to all you guys for showing up. It's really great to see this space packed. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is uh, for somebody whom I have not yet met, but I hope to soon. Uh, one of my favorite people in the world had a son last November. And this poem is called 111206 for Benjamin Wolf Schumann. Welcome, Ben, to this world of blur, to the sublime, the spurious, to all things curious. We've made room again. Welcome, Ben. Stay with us, Ben, through the coming thunder, and teach us to laugh, and when we turn rough and frightened, it may be soon then stay with us, Ben. You know, most of the rest of my poems are really short, so you probably don't want to clap between each one. Um, you, you might not want to clap just because you don't like them, but uh, anyway, uh, this, first, this next one is called Four Poems. Iago is shoplifting at QFC. Some wax dental floss, a packet of fennel, who will miss these things? <laughs> Iago figuring out his deductions. My Rottweiler, he's like a child to me. <laughs> Iago returning a Chumbawamba CD to Tower Records a week after purchasing it. This isn't the one I meant to buy. I didn't tape it. My tape player doesn't even work. Iago sending personal mail by putting the intended recipient's name in the return address space and then not affixing a stamp, thus creating a return to sender postal situation. Really just as an experiment. You know, I forgot to say when I came up here, I wanted to, I wanted to echo what Shannon said when she took the stage. Uh, and I, I, feel, I feel kind of dumb that I already voted uh, for myself. Uh, stupid. Um, so. Really nice to share the stage with such good poets tonight. Um, this next poem is, um, it was on Slate.com and somebody chimed in, one of their readers, and said it was exhibit A as to why mentally unhinged people shouldn't write poems. So it's a sonnet, it's called Update. My latent superpowers, well, they're back. Obliterate a marriage with my mind. Bewitch the president, that lying sack of Cody. Take it slow. In time, I'll find, please note I'm speaking as my therapist, the equilibrium that time affords. I've also rerouted, I have a list, one, my neural pathways, and two, some fjords. America's a country for the lonely, the loony. Whitman said it years ago. Remember, he could fly, and he was only an editor, a winged, bearded schmo. My powers have increased a hundredfold since you left, maybe a thousand, all told. <laughs> the vegetarian sustains an injury. The word hamstring, it depresses me. This next one is a prose poem, and um, it's called Submission. It has an epigraph from a no longer extant website, jayskids.com, that goes like this. A massive search is underway to locate the children of recently deceased legendary rhythm and blues singer Screamin' Jay Hawkins, who, by his own estimation, fathered 57 children. If you believe you are or know of one of his children, please click on Submission. So, Submission. Hawkins seduced my mom in the fall of 1966. They were watching the TV show Pistols and Petticoats, and they were at this party, and there was a lot of tie stick going around. The next morning, Hawkins took my mom to a voodoo basement where people practiced a lalagmancy, which is a way to predict the future based on the howling of dogs. The voodoo people told her that she would have a boy, and that the boy would swim through troubles like a frantic rabbit 
and emerge shining and righteous and dry. My cousin, stepfather's ex-girlfriend told me this story. In a lot of ways, it keeps me from killing myself. Um, sometimes I give my students the following assignment. Uh, take a comic form of limerick, uh, clairu, double dactyl, and try to write a serious poem. Um, I, I think the tensions are interesting. So the next poem comes out of that idea, and it harkens back to the anthrax days. So stop laughing. Snow nor rain. Higgledy piggledy, name not released as yet, handled the envelopes 20 odd years. Anthrax bacillus spores, paid on delivery, killed him on Saturday, send him your tears. <laughs> this is another, another uh, poem about that time, although that last one I wrote in 2001, this one I wrote just a few weeks ago. It's called 2001 Through a Glass Darkly. Hastert was plastered, Cheney was lit, just give me a minute, all fall down. Bush with a book, it's best not to look. Trade center, jets enter, all fall down. Fireworks, waterworks. But mostly air works, allowing you to say things for, let's say, 80 years. Finally, when air doesn't work, earth works. <laughs> Abbott and Costello, the Alzheimer's years. <laughs> Who's on first? My son? I have a son? <laughs> Limerick. A new class of antidepressants is targeted at adolescence. They lose track of time, of meter, of rhyme, it's really sad. <laughs> and uh, two more. Um, this is a quickie. This is called Earlier Today, Archival Edition. <laughs> Thinking the microphones were off, Secretary Rumsfeld yelled, kill, 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 kill. Jokingly, we think, but still. <laughs> and I'll end with a double abecedarian called Danger Static. And there are two potential obscurities in this poem. Uh, De Lunatico Inquirendo is a writ inquiring about the soundness of one's mind and a cosmic year is the time the sun takes to orbit in galactic rotation about 225 million years. Danger static. Arsenic in a blintz. Bats in a belfry. Caveats in a billet doux. Do you ever wonder how early man existed without TV? <laughs> Fuck you, grubby advertisement. Hey, Helena Bonham Carter, hold me in your arms. I have a crush on you, Helena Bonham Carter. Jury duty in Iraq, KKK at the A&P, loss, de lunatico inquirendo. Meet me in old Manhattan, near the abandoned oyster farm, or better, go to hell, purgatory, paradise, and be quick. Question, did horndog LBJ really have oral satori sex in hotel bathtub? Tongues are wagging. Ugh, oof, vaporize me, water lord. Xanadu in ruins, cosmic year complete, rub, dub, Zagreb, who cares, Yugoslavia. Thank you so much. <laughs>